From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours for May 3rd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Thanks for coming. Here. What you sure. got there for weather? Uh, I'm just looking it up. Uh, it says uh, 81 degrees. And outside it is, uh, well, we're getting on towards evening time, uh, maybe a high sort of light haze or something like that, but very pleasant. Uh, here it's kind of drizzly. It is, let's see, it is 10C and light rain. It's been like that for a few days. I could use some rain. Welcome, everyone to another Wednesday evening chat about viruses. And uh, I want to thank our moderators for stopping by tonight. We have Peak Dunning-Kruger. We have Tom Steinberg, Les. We have Barb Mack. And we have Steph. Thank you all for putting the time in to keep this a civilized live stream. Uh, I wanted to ask Tom if he remembers meeting Rich at ASV last summer. I think you guys did talk, but uh, why don't you uh, write it down there in the chat, uh, Tom? Let us know. And bef while he's queuing that up, I wanted to ask you, Rich. So I, I put a, a caricature of you on the uh, thumbnail. I don't know if you saw it, but here it is. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Who did that? Do you know? It was a listener. And ah. it was many years ago, and I don't know. And I, I believe it was a listener. And I looked at that, and then I looked at my image coming up, and um, uh, these people who do caricatures, uh, <laughs> really, they they nail it. This guy nailed it. He did. You know? and he's got his initials on your collar there, J.H. J.H. Uh, yeah. Maybe somebody out there remembers uh, who that was, but I believe it was a listener. Yeah. He made a bunch Long of them, I ago. think, for yep. everybody. Yep. He, yeah. did, he did all of the staff that was president at that time he did you dixon me uh yeah, alan, alan, alan too, and i yeah. think i think yeah he did kathy too i think so. so folks tell rich where you're from put it up on the chat and i will uh, highlight it so here's tom who is from western oregon coast range welcome uh liz uh, liz is from uh columbus ohio this is visiting the incubator on Monday. That should be cool. Um, who else here? Uh, uh, okay, lots of convos. Les is uh, one of our mods from California. Oh, here's Philip from Wales, UK. Claire is also from the UK. We have quite an international audience here. It's really cool. Uh, Luis is from Guatemala. Very cool. Mm, I don't. I don't know where Peak is. One of our uh, mods. I don't know where Peak is. Steph. He is says here. somewhere within Earth. He says. Yeah, okay. Barb. Uh, Steph is from San Francisco, <clears throat> as you can see. Um, uh, okay. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to uh, get used to this uh, chat thing. Are they coming in on a? Top or the bottom? They're coming in on the bottom. Yes, new comments yeah. are on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. And I, I select the ones that I'm going to address, and they come up on the main screen. Leo is from Mendocino Coast. Looking forward to Rich. John is in Minneapolis. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the bottom here. Oh, Simon is from the Bay Area. Uh, I want to know. Uh, Bay Area is not good enough. I okay, want to know Simon. where. Well, let's tell Rich where you are in the Bay Area. Uh, Colorado Rockies, that's also pretty uh, pretty wide mm -hmm. there. We got MK, who's from eastern Massachusetts. Gabriel's from Baja. Hmm. That's pretty yeah, cool. Cool. Uh, here's Mark Martin. Hello, Mark. He's our professor friend in Puget Sound. Tom says uh, he did indeed pastor me in an outside session. Sat next okay. to me at a banquet table of distinguished professors. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, 
And we had a Karen Sprague connection. Okay, cool. Brian's from Montreal. Yeah, I that Maureen's from Northeastern mm -hmm. Ohio. Oh, Peter is from Turkey. Look at that. That's pretty far away. Excellent. All right. Uh, Tomball, Texas. Do you know where that is? Tomball. No, I'd have to look it up. Ontario. I'm just giving you a sense of uh, where these individuals are. Vancouver Island. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> Mark is in Tacoma. Uh, Doreen is in Chicago land. Hello, Doreen. I met Doreen at ASV last year. Barb Mack is from Worcestershire. Noir is from Santa Fe. Noir was at the TWIV 1000. Alberta, Canada. Dayton, Ohio. Pete is from London with family in Dorset. Les is from Silicon Valley. Artemis is from Montreal. San Antonio, Texas. Portland, Oregon. Maine. Philadelphia. Holy cow. Columbus, Ohio. Santa Rosa, California. New Jersey, exit four. That's all the way down there. Sure is. <laughs> Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. Brazilian Amazon region. Wow. That's pretty cool. Cool. Uh, uh, Central Virginia, Sydney in Vancouver Island. New Ze oh, here's a New Zealander. Our moderator isn't here from New Zealand. El Paso, Texas, UT Health. I like that name, U Uracil, Uracil 87. Uracil 87, that's pretty good. Authentic New Yorker relocated to Asheville, North Carolina. Peak is from California, okie dokie. Uh, Longmont, California, middle of Kansas, Germany, all right, welcome. Atlanta, the land of Babesia. I don't know where that is. Could be anywhere. Boston, Massachusetts, Renzo. Buonasera, hello from Renzo. He's in Toronto. Uh, here's, here's Neva. Hello, Neva. Hi, Neva. We'll get back to your question in a bit. I want to get through some of these. Kentucky, Bucaramanga in Colombia. Wow. That's cool. This one is Monterey Park, California. Uh, let's see. Canada. The Laurentides from the deep wilds of Boston. Boston, always good to see Rich Condit. Alta, California. Where did you grow up? In Marin? Uh, born in Berkeley, grew up in Marin, went to Santa Cruz. Baltimore. Minneapolis. Allentown, PA, Silicon Valley, Japan. Hey, Japan. Cool. Abilene, Texas. Boston, I mean, please Japan, come. it's got to be like four in the morning or something like that. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, some, people are pretty well, hardy about this Maybe eight stuff. in the morning. Yeah. Um, Janet's from Boston. Please come and do a TWIV. We will. We're going to do a road TWIV there one of these days. Uh, Long Island, New York. I just, got, I just got back from Boston. I watched... Um, both, uh, I was at, in the in the stadium for both mm -hmm. games four and seven of the Bruins oh. round one playoff, Very which cool. they lost, and oh. it was pretty dramatic. Good game then, right? Uh, well, you know, they yeah, lost, right. so that kind of took the shine off it. But they both games went into overtime, so they were exciting. Hartford, Connecticut, Detroit. Uh, Alberta, Torrance, California, Staunton, Virginia, and there we go. Okie dokie. Let's go back to the top now and start. Is that everybody? It's everybody. We have, uh, so far, we have 183 people. Now oh, we have some more people here. Toledo, Ohio, University of Toledo. Never been there. Could do it. All right, so Long Island is the land of ticks and Babesia, apparently. All right. All right, I saw a question up top here. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. I wanted to um, I wanted to ask Rich about whether he knows the story of Benjamin Jesty. I'm, I'm sure you know this guy, the farmer from the U.K., he had cowpox, and then he vaccinated his wife, blah, blah, blah and uh, two sons, and then um, she uh, recovered. This was 22 years ahead of Jenner. 
Yep. Uh, I, I know the story only uh, peripherally. I've never, you know, studied it or read it, uh, read it in any kind of detail. But uh, anytime uh, you dig into the history of smallpox vaccination, Jesty comes up. Uh, and the point is made that, you know, Jenner was not the first. Jenner published. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, published. That's when um, you get it. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of these things are evolutions, right? Uh, yeah, People, sure. you know, capitalizing on other people's work. I guess, you know, a significant question is whether Je uh, Jenner knew about Jesty's work. I don't know yeah. that he ever mentioned him. I, uh, and I'm sure the answer is out there. I just don't know it. But, well, he could yeah. have, he, he did, might not have, he right? Because there's not a lot of communication back then. Right. I also d don't know whether uh, the degree to which uh, Jesty followed up, because Jenner really was on a campaign mm. to uh, eradicate smallpox. Okay. And so he not only published, but he, he pushed the method uh, and et cetera, and uh, helped. He was a driving force in, in popularizing it. Uh, right. But like I said, I don't know enough about uh, Jesty's story to really um, comment on him getting scooped. Yeah. <laughs> 22 scooped. years later. <laughs> 22 years. All right. Kang says, with the recent emergence of MPOX, what are the chances that a pox virus as deadly as smallpox will come arise? Huh. I think this is, this is an opinion, uh, and unfortunately, I'm usually wrong. But I think um, I think it unlikely. Uh, but you know how how the heck do you know? Mm. Uh, there are a number of pox viruses out there. I mean, there are a number of pox viruses that have a pretty broad host range. And they don't necessarily cause serious disease in all the hosts, and they may manifest differently in different hosts. But um, uh, there are a number of different pox viruses that will behave kind of like cowpox in humans. Um, Monkeypox, of course, uh, has uh, more systemic manifestations that resemble smallpox. Um, so that's uh pretty borderline what i think of when i think about this and uh, i think that they have enormously large and complex genomes with a tremendous fraction of that genome devoted to uh immune evasion and tinkering with the immune system in one fashion or another now, i suppose you could uh, argue that that gives them uh a uh, more robust capacity for immune evasion or something to uh, uh, spread better uh, in humans. Uh, but in my mind, it just makes adapting to humans a much more complicated project because you're dealing with so many mm. genes. All right. Uh, so I've never thought of it as, as very probable, but, you know, a lot of improbable things have happened. So are there any other pox viruses that occasionally infect humans? Well, <clears throat> not in the same way that smallpox does, uh, yeah. to my knowledge, okay? And by the, the, the distinction I'm making here, <clears throat> so smallpox, you catch as a respiratory infection, uh, and it um, uh, infects your lungs, and then establishes a viremia, where it spreads through the blood. And... Uh, then infects other internal organs and you get more virus it establishes a secondary viremia and then erupts on your skin. Um, and aside from uh, smallpox <clears throat> and monkeypox, I know of no other pox viruses that behave that way in humans. That mm -hmm. said, there are a number of different pox viruses <clears throat> that if introduced uh, to humans by, you know, contact through an open lesion or something like that will cause a pox or maybe a cluster of pox. That would include cowpox. I think most of the orthopox viruses, cowpox, camelpox, raccoon pox. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of them. Uh, and there are, oh, oh, there are also a number of parapox viruses. They're 
pretty different. Okay. Uh, but those uh, cause both animal and human uh, infections. But once again, in humans, I think they're limited to cutaneous infections. Um, and they don't, and they don't really spread. Uh, there's one other naturally occurring human pox virus called uh, molluscum contagiosum. And mm-hmm. I don't know much about the biology of that. Kids get it. Uh, it does um, uh, cause a, uh, there's, they're not really blisters. They're uh, knobby lesions on your skin. Um, uh, I don't know how well distributed they are, and I don't know whether the virus actually distributes itself systemically. Mm-hmm. But it's, uh, it's very different than monkeypox or smallpox. It's been around forever, and I know of no uh, variation in that. It's not uh, all that uncommon in infection in kids, and uh, it's uh, self-limiting. It's not, not a big deal. Yeah. So. All right, Simon wants to know why the Mpox outbreak ended with a whimper instead of taking off big time. Right. So, really good question. Uh, not that the previous question wasn't a really good question as well. And I hope I'm right. Okay. <laughs> uh, though I have to say, I'll go back for a minute. I have to say that, uh, you know, if there ever were a smallpox like virus outbreak, I think we're as well prepared as we could be. Um, You know, there are drugs. We know a lot about drug mechanisms. I don't know that the drugs would necessarily treat it the same way. There are vaccines and vaccine approaches, whether those vaccines would be cross-reactive with a modified, with a a new uh, human uh, pox virus or not. Don't know. And I recently just saw a paper about, now I'm going on here, but I got to do this. Um, I recently saw a paper about uh, research into an mRNA-based vaccine for pox viruses. I commented on this a while ago because I think uh, to some extent, and I don't want to slight any scientists uh, in this, but to some extent, uh, coronaviruses were kind of, we got in big air quotes, lucky, low-hanging fruit. It turned out that a vaccine that targeted a single antigen was sufficient to, uh, you know, beat back the infection sufficiently so that uh, it was it was effective. And we argued about this in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, right? Yeah. Uh, whether they ought to be uh, including another antigen. Um, pox viruses are not like that. Pox viruses have, you know, on the order of 20 or 25 proteins involved in attachment and entry into cells. Hmm. And so how do you figure out uh, what to target. This particular paper, paper had made a quadrivalent mRNA vaccine uh, targeting, there's two different envelopes on pox viruses and it t- uh, chose two uh, antigens from each envelope that are fairly well characterized and made an mRNA vaccine and it, you know, in animal models uh, appeared to work. So uh, that's all a long way of saying that if we got another uh, pox infection, I think we're about it. Uh, uh, as prepared as we could be. Now, monkeypox, I would go back to that Merschlinski episode because I think Mike nailed it. Um, uh, we did a, uh, people may recall, if you just do Twiv Merschlinski monkeypox, Google that, I think you'll find it. As a matter of fact, I think his name may even be in the title. Um, it's behavior. Um, yeah. Yep. This, Ooh, uh, what happened? Vincent just crashed. I will. And my uh, board went out. I don't know why. Huh. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's good. Just the board. It's funny. It must be a loose connection. Maybe I stepped on a wire. Um yeah. So, monkeypox. The uh, we learned a lot from this outbreak. Actually, uh, the virus uh, was apparently transmitted primarily by direct contact. Right. Uh, even though it can establish uh, a viremia and a systemic infection, 
the the vast majority, if not all, of the cases were uh, contracted by direct contact, where uh, a person with an uh, you know same as cowpox, person with uh, an open lesion or through a mucous membrane uh, had contact with uh, probably usually another lesion on another right. individual that actually right. contained a uh, virus. And we also learned a lot. We got lucky because it didn't affect a high percentage of people, but it required very intimate contact. The outbreak uh, was in the gay community and it stayed, although there's, there was some spill out from there, which was the, the biggest uh, fear, uh, there was uh, some, uh, it remained largely in the gay community uh, where uh, the opportunities for that kind of contact uh, were numerous. Mm. Uh, and I think there, it took a little while for people to catch on. Uh, and of course we had um, uh, vaccines and drugs already available that were deployed. But uh, most importantly, uh, there was uh, information and education deployed. And I think by and large, people got the message and uh, desisted in behaviors that would transmit the disease. And uh, that's good. Thank you. Uh, because it did stay uh, largely within that community. Uh, and they got their act together uh, and it burned out. Um, now I'm, you know, I haven't studied this in detail. So somebody may have other information they want to weigh in on in this, but I think that's probably pretty accurate. So Twiv 927, Merchlinski versus monkeypox. Thanks, Brigitte. For and that. His, bottom, his bottom line in the end was you want to stop this it's going to be behavior and and uh, and education, and I think I think by and large that's what happened. Yeah. And, and and you know, assisted by the fact that it was not very transmissible, you need a really very close, intimate contact to transmit it. Yep. And all, all right. symptomatic. Okay. Yes. All symptomatic. Uh, you could you could uh, or mostly symptomatic, not much mostly. asymptomatic. I mean, yeah. you know. The problem with the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, to me, in yeah. my mind, it became a pandemic when uh, people figured out that it would be transmitted a, uh, yeah. uh, um, asymptomatically. Okay? Exactly. Yep. Now, the, the smallpox didn't have a lot of asymptomatic transmission either, so it uh, no. really helps. And yeah. that, helped the, that helped the eradication of it, yeah. the uh, uh, effort. Uh, John wants to know, can you explain how vaccinia is related to smallpox? Um, all of the vertebrate pox viruses have a central core of genes that are very closely related. Uh, and then, and it's, a, a, it's about half of the genome. Uh, and then there is, uh, I'm thinking, I'm picturing the linear genome. And when I say central core, I mean these map to the center. This is not an uncommon phenomenon with DNA viruses uh, where the flanking regions on the linear genome harbor genes that are involved in uh, virulence and uh, pathogenicity, immune evasion mostly, mm. that kind of thing. And that's where a lot of the variation takes place. So many of the vertebrate pox viruses are very closely related when it comes to that central core, which is all the nuts and bolts, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, capping enzymes, mm. all the normal nucleic acid stuff. And the variation is in the uh, immune evasion. Um, I can't tell you chapter and verse. People, people have spent a lot of time, uh, and this relates to the previous question of whether there could be um, – uh, you know, uh, a new virus that acted like smallpox from one of the other existing vertebrate uh, pox viruses. People have tried, have asked this question, what's the relationship between vaccine and smallpox or other viruses of different host range and pathogenicity? And as I said before, you're talking about at least 100 genes that are involved in these phenomena. And it's probably very much a multi-gene effect. And so while you can compare them and try and 
uh, look at one gene at a time and figure it out. It's just, at least to date, much too complex a problem. Um, they all they all have a common ancestor somewhere way back there. Mm. Um, and uh, the origins of vaccinia are still being studied. Vaccinia is the, the current thinking is it probably actually derived from horsepox, which is now extinct. Um, and I can't do much better than that. There's differences in these uh, immune evasion genes that we don't understand. There's a common ancestor somewhere way back there in history that who knows what it infected, all right? And you wound up with strains that infected uh, horses, strains that infected uh, humans, and a fairly broad host range where there's a lot of uh, uh, cross infections as well. That's about all we know. It's about all I know. All right. The uh, RNA virus, April 29th and 30th, five people on vents in New Jersey, lowest since the outbreak today, eight. Amy said pandemic's over when there's one case per 100,000. 20 days. How about zero on vents in New Jersey for 60 days? I don't know what she meant by one case. If it's a positive, I mean, I don't think she meant people on vents. So, you know, we're not testing very much now. That's part of the issue. We don't really know how many infections there are yeah. out there. Right. I don't think you can really count cases anymore. Right. Right. And but, so hospitalizations becomes, or on vents, or some metric like that, becomes the better way to do it. But how, uh, I would say the pandemic's, uh, I would say the pandemic's over when uh, there's, uh, I'm just trying this out. I'm, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along. <laughs> I'm thinking excess mortality due to COVID, back down to background, okay? Where if you can quantify excess mortality due to COVID, if that's down to some background level mm -hmm. um, or, you know, equivalent to some other uh, endemic virus right? With a, similar, with a similar sort of pathogenicity, then the pandemic's over. What those data are, I don't know. Where we stand, that is. All right, Tom is talking about mir mirus viruses, a nature article, DNA, eukaryotic viruses, ocean ecology. So the, we're doing this paper on TWIV Friday, Tom. Uh, that's an interesting one. To, uh, Rich isn't going to be there, but we'll we'll see if we can handle it. And the other paper we're doing is a experiment from um, BioNTech where they took the mRNA vaccine and they added some T cell epitopes in uh, separate mRNAs and looked at that in an animal model because you were talking about adding other things in there and they that's one where they do that uh, peak wants to know do herpes viruses contain any proteins within their capsids or is it just dna in there no there's other proteins um and some of those now i'm not an expert on this either uh the dna i don't believe uh, I don't. I don't know whether the DNA has uh, proteins associated with it. I don't believe it has. Some DNA viruses have uh, you uh, package uh, package their DNA in uh, host histones. Herpes, yeah. I do not believe, does that. Vaccinia uh, packages its DNA in uh, its own sort of selection of uh, basic. Uh, DNA binding proteins. I don't know what the situation is with herpes viruses. I do know uh, that herpes has a tegument, right? Which is mm. kind of the, so herpes is this, it's an icosahedral, man, you really, I've been retired for seven years here. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I feel a little rusty and this is taking me back. This is uh, a, it's an icosahedral capsid with an envelope and there's essentially room, space, in between the icosahedral capsid and the envelope into which are packaged numerous uh, virus-coded proteins. And there's some terrific work on, not, uh, on it's not HS, it's on cytomegalovirus, I think, by Jim Allwine that investigated uh, this packaging process. It's absolutely fascinating. Matter of fact, even though it's old work, old by today's mm. our current standards. Uh, I saw him give a talk on this in ASV, and it must have been good because I remember it. And it talked about how this 
tegument, where it, where it comes from, how it's evolved, and the env- uh, the enveloping process. But uh, those proteins, uh, there have been a few experiments that indicate that those proteins serve to serve to um, tamp down the uh, various uh, the immune response, in particular the innate immune response, early during infection. I mean, makes perfect sense. You go in with a new virus, you would like to deploy a number of different proteins that uh, counteract a number of intracellular uh, defenses. Pox viruses have a similar thing. They got these things called lateral bodies, which are the sort of, in my mind, the equivalent of a tegument that sit between mm. the capsid and the envelope. And that's a uh, battery of proteins that are deployed early during infection that you know, they're not really very well characterized, I don't think, in either case. But I do know that there are some experiments to um, show that they combat the innate cellular immune response. All right. Uh, Brian wants to know, with the current variants, on average, how many days after onset of symptoms are people contagious? I don't average. Know the answer to that. Well, the... Um, the serial interval. Here's an here's an article from uh, EID in April. Serial interval of Omicron and Delta. So that's the time between two people getting some one, some person has infection, and then it's the time between the next one gets infected, right? The serial interval. And uh, so they have BA one and BA two. That's uh, three days for BA one two days for BA1 and three days for BA2, but four days for Delta. Sorry, the incubation period is three days for BA1, four days for Delta, and the serial interval, two days for BA1, three days for BA2, four days for Delta. So it speeded up a that, bit. In- that, uh, that, yeah, so speed it up a bit. But that tells you, that doesn't tell you how long you are contagious. No, it doesn't. After you've been infected. And... Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, the, these, these are probably, uh, old answers, but initially, uh, CDC wanted you to, uh, stay clear of people for 10 days. Yeah. Then they lowered it to five days. And a lot of people said, Oh, it's not enough. Um, yeah. I, you know, I would say, a, a, a swag scientific wild ad ass guess would be seven or eight days. And I don't know that there's any evidence that there's any difference in the length of contagion for uh, the variants. Uh, would you please describe the antigen used in the new RSV vaccine, prefusion F? Kind of like the spike, right? It's the uh, yeah. uh, same idea. You put some prolines in to keep it from going through a conformational change, which will remove the relevant uh, epitopes for neutralization. And what is the, is it a protein-based vaccine, this one? Um, I think it is, right? Do not know. Let's take a look. I know RSV that, vaccine. There's one is that's available Is this a licensed now. vaccine? Is yeah, that right? Yeah. Uh, Kathy was talking about getting it tonight. Yeah. If FDA approves RSV vaccine for adults 60 and up. It just six hours ago. <laughs> it's called RXV. Uh, so what is it? You think I'm going to find it here in this FDA announcement? <laughs> uh, you could try, but the other thing I always do is, uh, it's called what? A-R-E-X-Y. Uh, V-Y. Got it here. A-R-E-X-Y. Uh, it's, it's uh, Nope. I don't think that's it. Let me look again. A R E X V Y. You're right. <laughs> v Y. What a name. G S K. Mm. Lots of times, uh, uh, what I do, and I just did a search, but it was unproductive, is look for the uh, package insert. Yeah. Uh, for a vaccine, because uh, any drug or vaccine comes with uh a actually the official name of it uh from the manufacturers is called a label it is the label but it's actually a a sheet of paper that comes inside the product that has all kinds of great information about 
the clinical and preclinical trials, the safety record, and et cetera, and there will be a section telling you exactly uh, what it uh, consists of. So it's a it's a protein uh, vaccine, prefusion RSVF uh, with an adjuvant, aluminum okay. sulfate adjuvant, yeah. So it's approved. Cool. Uh, that's It's just the spike protein produced in some system. I don't know what it's made in, uh, what kind of cells. Uh, A-R-E-X-V-I is made in what cells? Let's see if we can get an answer. Uh, uh, uh. Not, not immediately. Anyways, the protein made in cells is purified and mixed with an adjuvant and injected into you. Kip, hello, Kip. Thank you for uh, your contribution. Kip and Laura were here uh, at the last year's fundraiser, but couldn't make TWIV, TWIV uh, 1000. You were here last year for the fundraiser, right, uh, Rich? In the uh, incubator? Yeah. So you met yeah, Kip you... and Laura from San Francisco. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Hi. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, what other measuring sticks do others use to gauge the pandemic? Well, some use ICU, looking for less arbitrary things, is or not when it's declared by HO. So, you know, a pandemic is disruptive. It's a new virus that starts to spread a lot of, to a lot of countries, and it disrupts the way you live and play and work. So when it's you know the cases are down and it's less disrupt. I don't know how you measure disruption though, right? <laughs> That's a tough one. It's easier to measure cases. Uh, but there are some countries that still have very low immunity. I don't know. Like Africa has very low immunity. But I don't know if that's a risk there because maybe they're not going to get many infections. Uh, I don't know, principle, what the real metric should be for saying it's over. I just don't know. Uh, Rich, you're well, You're special to me in part because I lived in Florida twice and worked for over a decade for a large computer manufacturer based in Austin, Texas, or near Austin, Texas. I wonder who that could be. Yeah, I could take yeah, a guess. Yeah, okay, so we've been following each other around, Florida and Texas. <laughs> yeah, office hours now with twice the virologists. That's right. <laughs> Oh, okay. Here's your your detailed location. He lives in a Willow Glen, San Jose, currently in my car in Cupertino. He's watching okay. in his car. Oh, cool. Be careful. He's pulled over. You think so? Did yeah. you see the the recent Nature comment on Rosalind Franklin? I did. Did you see that, uh, Rich? I did not. Tell me about it. It's about uh, you know revealing her real role in the dis mm -hmm. the, the elucidation of uh, the the structure. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, uh, it was uh, it was a different time then. So the article name is "What Rosalind Franklin Truly Contributed to the Discovery of DNA Structure." Franklin was no victim in how the structure was solved. An overlooked letter and an unpublished news article, both written in 1953, reveal that she was an equal player. Hmm. Yeah, so that's what this is about. This new information. Um, so it was originally said, you know, she couldn't figure out what her data were telling her. She supposedly sat on the image for months without realizing its significance, only for Watson to understand it as a glance, at a glance. And it turns out that that's not true. That's she, exaggerated. That, that's not a surprise. Yeah. It's too bad she died. She should have gotten a prize. Yep. Oh, well, it's a good article. Like it very much, David. Okie dokie. What do we have here? Rich, I saw you've written several papers on trees. How'd you get so knowledgeable and interested in them? <laughs> uh, this is great. Uh, I know of two other Richard Condits in the world. Oh, you didn't do this. One, huh? of, one of whom is an ecologist uh, who is, he's a forest ecologist. Okay. And I used to get strange papers to review uh, all the time that were way, that were in, you know, tropical ecology of one sort or another. And so I figured out who this guy was. And in fact, he's about my age. And he even, he was a graduate student at Santa Cruz. 
He was a graduate student in the laboratory or under the mentorship of a professor who I did an independent study with studying sea otters for a while. Uh, and then recently hmm. I got an email from a guy named Rick or Richard Condit at Lamar University outside of Houston, I think that is, who is a jazz saxophonist who forwarded to me an email that he got asking him for a review of paper on uh, tropical ecology. Mm. And so I said, dude, this is much more complicated than you might think. And so we had a three-way conversation going for a while uh, uh, via cool. email with Richard Condit, the tropical ecologist, Rich, me, Richard Condit, and Rick Condit, the jazz saxophonist, trying to probing what might be common in our family histories, et cetera. So that's the story there. Vanity Nutrition is in the house. Thank you, Vanity, another one of our moderators. Good to see you. All right, Leo has one for you. As a fellow Marin County brat of the 60s, 70s, do you think that kids nowadays can find the same opportunities and natural resources that we had? Yes. Okay. I think they're there. The question is, will they take advantage of them? And I think about this all the time because Marin County was really uh, uh, fundamental to my sort of intellectual development, the, just the physical aspects of the place. Because I was outdoors all the time. I've told this story many times. We had a creek in the backyard. I spent all my spare time in the creek mm -hmm. watching the pollywogs, okay, building dams. We built rafts and rafted up and down the uh, up and down the creek. I was on my bicycle all the time, uh, running all over the hills, sliding down the uh, West Coast equivalent of sledding is uh, riding down uh, a uh, hill of brown grass on a piece of cardboard, okay? Uh, and traipsing all over the place, playing games of one sort or another, flying kites. When I could drive, I was up and down the coast. I was up and down uh, uh, Mount Tamalpais. I don't, I wonder, e even me, if I had to do it over again, I might have my nose in a computer or a phone the whole time hmm. and never go outside. Okay. Uh, Marin County has been remarkably preserved. Uh, they've done a really good job of keeping it. Uh, from what I can tell, of, of being spoiled uh, by restricting the growth to some extent by focusing on uh, water rights and et cetera, uh, which is perfectly logical because they uh, that can be an issue. Um, so I think all the resources are still there. I'm not sure that people take the same advantage of them, especially as kids. Maybe they do. Mm -hmm. I hope so. So Mandrake says, I bet you have good antibodies to amoeba and fungi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I hadn't right. actually thought about, I hadn't actually thought about uh, the uh, creek contributing to my immune status. Maybe that's why I haven't had COVID yet. Maybe. All right, given that COVID transmission is airborne, does the two meter, six foot difference distance from an infected person still make sense? What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think it still makes sense. Okay. Uh, we have, we have this conversation all the time. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't worry about it anymore. Okay. I'm not, I'm not measuring my distance from people. I think I just started, uh, did I say while we were on air that I went to two Bruins games? Yeah. Uh, last week and then flew to and from Boston and hung out in airports and I don't wear masks or anything anymore. I, I, I behave like you know, it's just normal. But in terms of uh, the contagion, if you're going to, if somebody is sick with COVID, I think the two meter thing makes some kind of sense. But you know, it's not black and white, it's a gradient. All right. Uh, the closer you are to some, uh, so I understand it in terms of the, and the vocabulary here is tricky. Um, what does airborne mean, Vincent? <laughs> You know, it's a word for greater than ten, six six feet, ten feet. It can go a long distance, right? Okay. As opposed to droplets so, which fall to yeah. the ground, yeah. Okay, fine. Because we've had all these conversations about droplet transmission, airborne transmission, aerosol transmission, et cetera, yeah, right, and how to right. define these how to define these different terms. Yeah, you can detect transmission over a distance larger than 
uh, two meters or six feet. But how efficient is that relative to within two exactly. feet? What's the gradient? Okay, if you uh, if you were to measure, if you could somehow quantify transmission as a function of distance, uh, I'm not even sure. Uh, you know how how steep would that curve be? Would it be linear? Probably. Mm. Might I, I'm not I'm not even sure of that. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, I. I have a, a hunch that most of it is like droplet transmission. Uh, and from that point of view, that two meters, six feet, at my, by my understanding, still makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Peter wants to know if Arcturus is anything to worry about, or is it just another variant that the press is pushing? <laughs> Probably nothing to worry about. I think it's just another sub-variant that, uh, yeah. you know, is more fit takes over whatever i don't think it's an issue my biggest question is whether i i have this sort of call it an intuitive feeling it's probably more than that uh that the variation is going to slow down it would make sense if if there are if there's less virus circulating there's going to be lower numbers less opportunity to uh, mutate and create mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. new dudes, okay? So I'm, I'm kind of anticipating that over time it will settle down. Vincent, we did that, the paper from Jesse Bloom's lab, uh, where they uh, looked, a brilliant paper, where they looked at the uh, uh, immune, the antigenic variation in one of the existing other human yeah. coronavirus, uh, coronavirus cold, yeah. over time. Yeah. They looked at the variation in human immune status by comparing serum, and they also looked at the variation uh, in the virus. And they discovered for the first time, because people didn't really real, hadn't, hadn't really characterized this, that yes, the virus does vary. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you there are variants that arise where you have uh, less cross-reactivity than uh, previous variant. But my sense was that that was a longer time scale, uh, that it was on the order of years. Okay. Uh, That's correct. That, That's correct. Yes. Uh, um, and, and, and I'm, uh, uh, way out of my wheelhouse here. Not really. I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if years from now at genuine equilibrium, this virus kind of slowed down in the variation and behaved mm. in a similar fashion. Yeah, I, I think that's. And I don't worry about prediction. I don't worry about any of these new guys. If something if something really wildly nasty shows up, we'll all hear about it quickly enough. Uh, but these little blips uh, in the news don't bother me. I've lost track of them all. Uh, Mark Martin wants to hear about viroids, escaped introns or not. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard them referred to as escaped introns. I just taught the viroid lecture last week. And, you know, we think they're from the RNA world, these self-replicating RNA molecules that don't code for any protein. I haven't heard that they're escaped introns. Have you? That's a new one to me. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, you know, some of them have ribozyme activity. So they are self-splicing introns. I guess that might be where that, that's going. that's where my head went when the question came up. Yeah, but uh, I, I I think they're from the RNA world, absolutely. But who knows, right? We're never going to know. All right. Uh, any thoughts on second round of Paxlova due to rebound? No, uh, Daniel always talks about this, and he thinks it's so. When you have this rebound, you're in the inflammatory phase when the the viral loads are way down. So it doesn't this make sense? To, according to Daniel, does it make sense to take Paxlovid? And so he's going to do another rant about that on this week's update because uh, people are saying, "Yeah, we have to take more Paxlovid," but no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> and who's the guy who we interviewed who does debunk the funk? Dan Wilson. Because one of the uh, episodes that I listened to as we were preparing for him was debunking the notion of Paxlovid rebound. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because that, uh, and his rap, and I think Daniel would support this, uh, is that that's a, it's a misnomer. 
uh, COVID does this, it, or SARS-CoV-2 does this. Yeah. The disease does this. It it sometimes uh, seems to go away and then comes back in a certain percentage of cases. And that percentage is apparently no different uh, as uh, in Paxlovid users uh, than in uh, people who don't. So what's being called Paxlovid rebound is just SARS-CoV-2 doing its normal thing. That's right. It's the inflammatory phase, yeah. Uh, Mandrake says there's pox viruses that liquefy insects uh, used as pest control, right? <laughs> there are insect pox viruses. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to... Uh, I, now you're really uh, digging back into my history here. Um, I think when I think of uh, pesticidal DNA viruses that liquefy insects, I think of bacular viruses. Yeah. Right. Because I think they, uh, they, I'm sure that they do that. Uh, what, I'm going to have to look it up. Whether there are insecticidal um, uh, pox viruses or not. There yeah. are insect pox viruses. I do know Entomo, that. Entomo, right? Entomo pox virus. Entomo yeah. pox virus. And they say here these uh, um, are pest control agents. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. okay. So you're ahead of me on that one. Uh, any updates on the idea of persistent spike protein found, be it from vaccine or infection? I thought this wasn't possible, but two recent papers on the subject. Thoughts? I don't think there's any persistent spike in more than a couple of weeks, but there are there are some papers, uh, yeah, and, and you know there's one there's a preprint, uh, two preprints, and I, I don't know what the disposition of those are. There's one that says circulating spike is associated with post-acute COVID sequelae. That's a that's a problem. That's association. It doesn't mean it's doing anything, right? But uh, in this cohort. They find spike in a majority of the patients up to 12 months post-diagnosis. That would surprise me, 12 months, wouldn't it surprise you? Yeah, it would surprise me. The only other thing I think of is that uh, your immune system does squirrel away antigen for an extended period of time. But I would think in quantities that would be difficult to measure. Yeah. So I, I don't know. These papers are not papers. They're just... Preprints, they've been sitting there for a while. So, Keep an eye on it. Yeah, I mean, there may be issues. I'm a little skeptical, K-Ban, you know. Can there be a twiv with historians of pandemics? Yeah, I've been meaning to get John Barry on for a while. Um, he would be good, right, Rich? Yeah. He, he actually agreed years ago, and I never got back to him. So I have to be get in touch with him. <clears throat> We've had, you know, I don't know if David Quammen fits into that, but we've interviewed him a couple of times. It's we not, have. It's more like spillover events. It's not really, and plus it would be nice to, that was mostly, it would be nice to get, uh, uh, you know, other, uh, a historian that could discuss stuff like the plague. Yeah. All right. Karen wants to know, is H5N1 affecting backyard birds in addition to poultry? I've heard reports of fewer birds spotted at bird feeders. I'm not aware of it. I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I know it can really handle chickens. I mean, I was at um, University of New Hampshire last week, and I met with a veterinary microbiologist, and he said it, it can wipe out chicken farms in the area, you know, a duck comes and deposits some virus in the pond, and then the next few days the chickens are all dead. So, so Vincent, uh, I, have, I haven't I have really uh, followed this. What's the status of H5N1? So a lot, there's a huge bird epizootic at the moment, right? Uh, migrating birds all throughout the, the, the northern hemisphere. It's all over North America, much more than before. We don't know why. Uh, and they are transmitting it 
because it's pooped out, right? They're transmitting it to farm birds who are outside, chickens and whatever else. And in them, it's a lethal infection. Uh, but the real concern, as far as I can see, is that a bunch of mammals have been getting infected now, um, so minks uh, on farms, but also uh, sea mammals uh, like uh, like sea lions and so forth. And apparently a dolphin. There have been some terrestrial mammals, uh, raccoons and bears now uh, infected. And that never really happened a lot before. So, you know, the idea that it is... Um, somehow changing to be able to infect mammals uh, is, is a little bit of a concern. Yeah. Uh, is there, um, uh, well, a couple of things. Is there any evidence for transmission amongst these non-avian species or even in the uh, farm birds? Yeah, well, in the birds it is transmitted, but that's not, that's okay. not surprising. Um, right. Yeah, in some mammals there seems, there's some evidence for, for transmission. Um, the mink, the mink uh, outbreak, which was on a farm, uh, does seem to have uh, – that was in Spain. Um, and the, the coastal seals in New England, uh, they're still saying potentially driven by mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmission. I think it's hard to nail it down, right? Uh, but okay. it, So it, it could be happening, yeah. And, you know, I wonder if it's really a matter of – any sort of change in the virus that makes this happen, or if we're just talking about uh, if anything changes of a kind that just up the numbers because it's so populous now, so prevalent in uh, in the migrating birds, yeah, that yeah. it just ups the frequency of spillover into other species because flu does this, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, you you recalled uh, the other day a graphic that uh, you've doubtless used in your flu lectures that has uh, humans in the middle of a circle of other animals yeah, and arrows right. going all over the place with uh, uh, transmission amongst all these different creatures. Yeah. Yep. All right. The, the CDC had a conference that turned into a COVID outbreak. Hope 12,000 was not a COVID spreading event. As far as I know, no nobody have reported that they got covid from it so there's no secret i think i think twiv listeners uh, get vaccinated <laughs> uh i am just amazed that i haven't had covid yeah you're going uh, all every, over the place every, yeah yeah i'm i'm vaccinated to the max but i i strongly suspect that there's a lot of host variability in the susceptibility of the virus and I hope somebody out there is doing a bunch of genome-wide association studies to try and figure this out. Um, and I, I feel like I may have, of course, I may get COVID, but I feel like so far, at least, maybe I've won the gene lottery. Mm. Could have get your genome sequence, but there'll be too many SNPs. You won't know which one. Yeah, is the key, right? Can you explain simply for amateurs how you know what a teensy virus looks like? <laughs> Electron microscopy. You know, um, the teensiest viruses that I know of, you can get a pretty good uh, look at in an electron microscope. The trick is getting enough of the virus in a purified enough state to actually see it. Um, but uh, nowadays, that's easier and easier. Um, and then beyond that, there are numerous methods for actually determining the atomic structure, mm. including cryo-electron microscopy and x-ray crystallography um, that uh, where you get a, a detailed molecular description of, of what it looks like. And I've done some electron microscopy in my time. And it's a blast to actually see these things. Very cool. If you, uh, you know, do a Google search, do electron microscope viruses, okay? Oh, yeah. And you'll get it. You'll get a bunch of images, a lot of them uh, from Fred Murphy, okay? You know, the iconic Ebola uh, uh, image that Vincent has a painting of on his wall. <laughs> was uh, taken by Fred Murphy. We have interviews with him on TWIV as well. 
And you can find libraries of electron microscopic uh, images. I think Fred has his own. I think yeah. the NIH has, uh, has libraries of these images, and they're fascinating. And it really emphasizes um, not only are there, you know, commonalities, but there's an extraordinary variety of size and shape and everything else. Great stuff. Uh, did we ever settle the question of how MPOX transmitted? Only touch? Close contact? Primarily, I would say, close contact, touch, yeah. actual direct contact with an active lesion. I, I would say that uh, I wouldn't exclude the possibility that there's uh, some transmission uh, by a respiratory route or something like that. But I think the vast majority of what we saw uh, in this in this outbreak was uh, direct contact. And usually with pox viruses, that means not just contact of an active lesion that contains virus with any old skin, but skin that has a break in it or a mucous membrane. Okay, mm. a good, healthy, keratinized epidermis is a pretty good protective boundary against a virus infection. So you got to make a break in that or get in through a mucous membrane, which doesn't have the same uh, le uh, last level of, uh, of protection. Can you help someone who doesn't follow U.S. politics that closely? What JFK Jr.'s problem is with vaccines? Is it just a knee-jerk skepticism? about big pharma? <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's not a problem at all. He's making money. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I think uh, a lot of these heavy duty uh, anti-vax people make a lot of money uh, uh, selling themselves by, you know, if you heard in, uh, you know, if, if you hear lectures with him, he's getting paid a lot of money uh, to give lectures. And a lot of them, have uh, alternative medications uh, that they peddle on the side. I don't know if um, Kennedy uh, is is one of those, but uh, for most of these people, the bottom line is, I mean, there's a little bit of notoriety. They like being in the news, uh, but I think uh, mostly the bottom line is money. Doreen, thank you for your uh, contribution. For Rich, so many bats in Austin. I know they're good neighbors for eating mosquitoes, but are Texans at elevated risk for spillover infections? You know, I'm going rowing tomorrow, and I will row under that bridge, and you can smell the bats. And every, <laughs> every time I do this, I wonder what's going to rain down on me. So far, so good. Uh, I don't know of any evidence in any of these bat-populated uh, uh, areas of sort of an overall higher level yeah. of yeah. Uh, spillover or anything like that. You know, uh, we've mixed it up with all of these creatures for um, millions of years, and by and large, it's okay. It's a little, you know, it's a little dicier now because there's too many damn people. <laughs> uh, and they're uh, living in very close proximity to some of these uh, creatures. But I know of no, you know, any data or statistical evidence that there's a higher risk of uh, spillover in bat populated areas. I think we're good. I think we can go out and watch the bats and everybody will be fine. Well, I don't think there are any uh, SARS like coronaviruses in those bats. They're very geographic. Oh, I'll bet you there so, are. You think so? Why don't you grab one uh, and sample I, it? Okay. Actually, I don't know if they've sampled those bats at all, but I don't uh, know. I, I'm not sure you find. Actually, that you know who would know who is Jason know? McClellan. Yeah, he might know. He might know. Uh, Rich, I used to work in a lab in Alberta studying oncolytic viruses. Grant McFadden's name was often mentioned. I think he must have sent us virus mixoma. Maybe does he do oncolytic work? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, he would have sent. He would have sent you mixoma. Lab in Alberta. So Grant was uh, a professor in Edmonton for yeah. quite a period of time. And his right. whole career was on uh, myxoma virus. He went from Edmonton to, what is it, um, uh, uh, Western Ontario. It's a, in Hamilton. I forget. University there for a while. And then to University of Florida for 10 right. years where we overlapped. And um, then to Arizona State University. Uh, and his work evolved from, over time, from 
uh, basic biology of myxoma viruses, focusing mostly on DNA replication, to uh, a long stint of time on immune evasion, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, winding up uh, studying the potential of myxoma as uh, a, an a oncolytic virus. Yep. Uh, by the way, the, the question we just did, uh, it's not JFK, of course, it's RFK. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> right. Thank you, uh, MK, for pointing that out. Uh, Catherine wants to know, how do we handle the next pandemic with such distrust occurring towards government, big pharma, et cetera? Hmm. Big problem. Yeah, we have That's, to do it better than it. we did. Yeah, it could be that the biggest uh, the biggest uh, problem that came out of all of this, a most recent thing, was the politicization of the science uh, and the and the public health. Yeah. Though I always think of the two quotes that I paste back to back. One from my friend Bob Chen, who says that. Public health is, by its very nature, a mashup of science and politics. Mm. And Peter Daszak, who said that when you mix science and politics, you get politics. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a huge problem. Uh, in some ways, now here's a cynical outlook. In some ways, SARS-CoV-2 was not lethal enough. Okay? Because... Um, mm. You know, you could, if you were a, if you were a, a 30 something, you could look at this and you could look at, you look at the real data and you could say, even on average, my chances of dying of this are uh, only maybe 3% or something like that. And in fact, I'm young and healthy. It's only mostly the old people who are kicking off. So why should I care? Um, if you had something like smallpox breakout, where 30% of the people who get infected are dying and they're covered in blisters and they're in dire pain. My guess is that the politics would go away and people would suck up a vaccine like crazy. But mm. you raise an important point. Uh, I, uh, and that's, that's what we try and do with what we're doing right now. And, and with TWIV is try and help people understand uh, that, you know, what science is uh, and that the people are trustworthy, um, but uh, there's a certain percentage of people out there who are not interested. What qualities, attributes, and traits should science educators have to engender trust in the public prior to the next pandemic? Kind of similar question, right? Yeah. I mean... You know, the, the you have to, honesty has to be one of them, clarity, straightforwardness. But as Rich said, you have to separate it from the politics, but you can't. You can never do that. It's always been wrapped up in politics. You, you know, one of the things I think of, of course, you know, as I've said many times, I think the the most important thing we can do as science educators or educators in general is teach critical thinking. And you don't have to teach science to do that. Um, you, science is just one example of critical thinking. Uh, it can tell people to ask questions and uh, to check their resources uh, and try and by trial and error and talking to people and figuring out who to trust and who not to trust. So that's a dangerous area because people make that decision incorrectly lots of times. Uh, but try and, you know, figure out how to figure stuff out and maybe we can help uh, uh, facilitate that process. Um, I just expunged from my head another point I was going to make. Maybe it'll come back. I think I think we have a role to play for sure, but uh, we have to expand our base, right? Because not enough people are listening. I know what I was thinking of. I was thinking when it comes to you know trust. Um, I personally, I think it's. Um, comforting to hear a science uh, scientist say, I don't know, or to hear a scientist say, oh, we got that wrong. 
here's why it was wrong. And here's, you know, what we now know to be the answer. And yet, when that does happen, especially in a public uh, figure, um, the reaction in the current environment is to say, uh, is to look at the first statement and say they lied, okay? Or they're flip-flopping, or they're not giving us a straight story. So uh, somehow we have to communicate mm. that science is, a, is an active, moving thing, okay? And you don't have all the answers all the time. Matter of fact, you never have all the answers. Uh, and in any given uh, situation or any uh, given problem, it evolves, yeah. okay? And somehow we have to uh, teach, probably by example, uh, teach people to, to uh, trust that people are doing the best they can in the moment. And it is the nature of science and scientific investigation for the story to change as we learn. People don't like that. They want, they want answers. They want quick, uh, short, dirty answers. Yeah, and, and, and they don't like when we change the answer because yeah. that's the way science is. You know, But I'm changes. sorry. Yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> I trust science, not scientists, Rich. Yeah. Because the field is not a fallible human thing. Humans are humans. They make mistakes. But together, all the science that's done by different humans, you know, that's, that's the amazing thing. We say, we say this over and over again. It's that science is self-correcting. Right. Uh, and I never, I never worry, to, you know, I try and take a long view uh, because uh, in the long run, Mm. The truth floats. All right. I mean, look at, uh, I don't hear a whole lot of people uh, arguing anymore about the notion that climate change, that there's a human role to play in climate change. Okay. Because it has become so obvious. Um, uh, and so people now just accept that. And you can go, I, most people, I'm sure you're going to find some, some naysayers. Uh, you can go back probably through uh, the the history of science and find one after another of these things where there's distrust of uh, science and the scientists uh, at a certain period of time. And over time, because of the self-correcting nature of science, the truth emerges and then people forget about all that controversy. They still don't trust the scientists, mm. but, you know, right. trust the science, as you said, trust the science. Trust the science. Uh, Brian says, molluscum contagiosum was by dissertation virus. All right. Very cool. Go for it. Uh, that's uh, that's a tough one because this is one of these ones you can't grow in culture. Mm. Right? Yep. That's hard when you can't grow your virus. Yep. Oh. All right. Back to Kip. Sisters, NP at Vanderbilt, TXed the first MPOX patient. Ah, in Tennessee, since then has taken two doses of full-strength genios, but is concerned over the MPOX cases in vaccinated HIV people. Advice. Hmm. Okay, so it's a, she's a nurse or NP, nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner. and is worried uh, about uh, contracting it, even though she's got two doses of genios. Well, I think uh, you you use gloves and a and a and a coat and a mask, right? And you are not going to get that kind of contact that would give you uh, uh, yeah. MPOX, even in, yeah. in HIV patients where they, they may be having a lot of, I don't think that's a concern. No, you know? I think, uh, yeah, I think you can, uh, I think you can avoid it um, just with PPE and appropriate uh, procedures. Plus, you know, the, it turned out that the case fatality rate uh, with this infection was something like 0.01%. Mm -hmm. Going into this, we knew there were two strains of monkeypox, and the uh, the sort of dogma was that the more virulent strain had a case fatality rates of up to 10%, and the less virulent strain, which uh, was this, had case fatality rates of about 1%. It turns out that uh, in this population, in this outbreak, it was a hundredfold less than that. Hmm. Okay. So the chances of getting, um, and I don't know in what sort of people those were, they may have all been people with underlying conditions or, or mostly people with underlying conditions certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't surprise me. Uh, not only that, but we have not only the vaccines, but we have drugs. 
couple of different drugs that are very effective. So uh, under the worst case scenario where you picked up an infection, you'd be okay. So I think you can avoid it, uh, but it's also not something to be too alarmed about. Philip says we've had cases of severe antivirus infections with myocarditis in babies under 28 days in Wales. How common is this? It's not very common, but it does happen. Yeah, you would you would know more about this than I do, Vincent. And Amy would know the most. Yeah. But um, yeah, so these are not, I would say, common, but they do happen in some newborns. You can have disseminated infections. You can have myocarditis. You can have CNS infections. Um, but uh, you know, most pe most people who get these infections don't get sick, and so I don't know what the frequency is. I don't have a number for you. Um, but uh, often the, the babies get sepsis, but this is very rare. Okay, that's the good news. But when you see them, you, there's a lot of attention paid to them because they're severe. So, you know, it's kind of and, scary. And you do get you do get clusters of these, right? You can, yeah, yeah. Uh, poxes and other animals, salmon gill pox virus, and what about entomopox in a cool histology? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, there are. Pox virus is basically everywhere. Does uh, pox occur in pox. birds and reptiles? I guess it does, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. There are avian pox viruses. There is a crocodile pox virus. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about snakes and turtles, but it certainly wouldn't. I, my guess is if you look hard enough, you'll find them everywhere. Uh, what I don't know is mm. uh, these are all animal viruses. I don't know of any plant pox viruses hmm. or fungal plant. pox viruses. Let's look oh it up. God. Plum pox. Uh, is that really? It says That's here plum pox virus. Uh, yeah, but is it really? Let's see. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it doesn't say in this little article. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that I don't know if it's a real pox virus, but it just may cause things, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh, like it's poxes. a pody virus. It's a pody. It's a okay. Plump pox virus is a pody <laughs> virus. So that's a plant virus. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, and this is confusing um, because uh, people focus on the name pox. And that, you know, this is important. As you might imagine, in the evolution of taxonomy, that is the naming of, of viruses. Uh, the first thing that people focused on was symptoms uh, mm. with uh, not necessarily, in a, I mean, they didn't even know that there was, were viruses causing these things, but they knew that uh, some diseases presented themselves as blistering lesions, which were called pox. And in right, fact, right. smallpox right. is smallpox to differentiate it from big pox, which was syphilis that made it larger blistering lesions and chicken pox. Okay. Uh, is a herpes virus, not a pox virus. Uh, so right. there are lots of things that <laughs> cause lesions that people call pox, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the same virus. Okay, Yvonne says, given we give yearly boosters for flu, why is giving boosters after full vaccination for COVID frowned upon? <laughs> well, I would say we we have good evidence that we need a boost uh, to change. Occasionally, we change the flu vaccine. We need you get it every year because it it's not a great vaccine and it work doesn't work so well, right? In terms of protection, so you need to get a boost every year. But there's less evidence that you need that for the COVID vaccines. They're really good, and it's not clear that a boost will really help outside of a couple of months where Daniel Griffin would say, "Yeah, you get a boost in antibodies for a couple of months." So if you want to really lessen your chance of being infected, that's going to do it. But, um, you know, as Paul Offit says, it prevents severe disease in most people. So no evidence that you need uh, a booster. The, the original series, three series, is really still good at preventing severe disease. And if you get infected on top of it, then you're really golden. Having at least three shots, not two, but three, that's yeah. important. That's uh, right. With a, with a, uh, months long interval between the second and the third. 
to yeah. let your um, immune system uh, uh, mature. Um, and yep. I think you know, I don't I don't know that boosters is necessarily frowned upon. It's just that there are uh, uh, folks who will say, as Vincent just did, that there's no real evidence that they're uh, going to do you a whole lot of good. And I think what uh, the one of the things, too, that's come up is uh, the big question is, should we be chasing variants? OK, should we have uh, should we, you know, make a new a new vaccine every time a new variant comes up? And I think the answer to that is clearly no, because they're they're coming up uh, so frequently. And yeah. who knows, we may wind up with an annual uh, COVID vaccine, but I think that depends on uh, what the uh, long range, you know, how this pans out in terms of the antigenic variation uh, in the long range, whether that's uh, whether that's really going to be necessary. Uh, thank you, Jan, for your contribution to science communication. We appreciate it. Uh, John wants to know, has anyone checked in with BARDA recently? Are we sufficiently stockpiled with Genios? If so, do we need to maintain any ACAM 2000 going forward? <laughs> so let's give a little background on this. Um, there have been, I would say, um, three, gener three generations of pox virus vaccines. Uh, the first that was used during the smallpox eradication campaign was a live vaccinia virus that was grown on the bellies of calves. Uh, and the lymph from those confluent lesions on the bellies of calves was harvested and not really purified, uh, sort of uh, spin out the big pieces and add a little phenol to discourage bacterial uh, growth in the uh, preparation itself. And um, uh, just lyophilize it and then give it by scarification. And by the way, the one of the papers that um, described the first bacteriophage by uh, Frederick Tort mm -hmm. in 1917, he discovered phage by, he was trying to figure out something about the smallpox vaccine and he could take a loop full of the smallpox vaccine and streak it out on a Petri dish and it would grow a bunch of bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> and he noticed that there was something eating away at the bacteria. So that first generation vaccine uh, would uh, uh, not pass the FDA nowadays. Uh, when uh, the, uh, after 9-11 uh, and we decided to ramp up biodefense the mandate came forward for uh, a smallpox vaccine sufficient to give coverage of everybody uh, and two drugs. And the first thing that was done was to uh, plaque purify, that is genetically purify virus out of the smallpox vaccine and develop methods for growing it in culture uh, and then processing it and packaging it in a fashion that would uh, pass muster with the FDA according to current uh, safety protocols. Nevertheless, that was still a live vaccinia virus that was administered in the same fashion uh, as previous vaccines and subject to the many of the same kind of side effects. Okay. There's a certain, there's about a one in a million chance that you'll die of a primary smallpox vaccination. One in a hundred thousand chance you'll have some serious adverse effect. It's, uh, you know, it is not the safest of vaccines, but it did eradicate smallpox. At any rate, that's generation two. And that's what we're talking about with ACAM 2000. And there's enough ACAM 2000 in the stockpile to cover everybody. Okay. So in a real emergency, we'd be okay. You'd have some, you'd have some uh, adverse effects from it. Uh, but uh, the risk would out, uh, the benefit would outweigh the risk. Plus, in the event of adverse effects, we now also have drugs, and the drugs work really well. So, if somebody had a bad reaction, you could probably um, uh, mitigate that to a large extent. Going forward, then we have um, uh, virus that has well, it's been passaged in culture five hundred times. Okay. Uh, which is a typical way of attenuating a virus. And this generated MVA, modified vaccinia and CARA, uh, which uh, essentially is Genios. 
okay? Uh, which is a virus that is live in the sense that you can grow it in culture. You can grow it on chick embryo fibroblasts or a baby hamster kidney cells, but it doesn't grow on human cells and it doesn't replicate to any great degree in humans. You can't use it by scarification. You have to inject it. At the time of the monkeypox outbreak, there was not enough of that stuff to cover the population. And in fact, what we had, uh, I believe, was in uh, fairly large batches that had to be split up and aliquoted. Uh, I, I'm sure that there is an effort to basically replace ACAM 2000 with Genios. Um, mm. And at that point, we would not have to maintain any more ACAM 2000. And I would think that the Genios or equivalent would become the vaccine of choice. I don't think there's any point in torching the ACAM 2000. You never know. You might uh, find a use for it. It could be that the Genios under some circumstances might not be as effective. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you wouldn't have to maintain it, I wouldn't think. All right. Catherine writes, has your opinion of Peter Daszak changed in light of several believing he was involved in covering up human to human transmission in Wuhan? Do you know if that's true or more misinfo? I don't think Daszak was involved in any of that. I don't think he had any clue. Um, I think that it was probably some, some, some uh, local government or higher up government over there covering it up in China. I was reading an article today about in the New York Times about how uh, China's trying to rewrite the early days of the pandemic history, right? And uh, this this is a part of the discussion that they early on said, no, nah, it's not transmitting uh, among humans when, you know, that kind of a, an epidemiological footprint most likely was. So whether they're trying to cover it up or not, I don't know. But no, Dashak had nothing to do with it. Dashak is not, not another one of these people I trust. I do. I do. And he uh, he gets he gets uh, wronged by the press often um, that uh, you know he's doing gain of function and this and that and and he really <laughs> is just uh, I think he's a straightforward guy he's been on Twiv twice and he's straightforward with us right yeah yeah the press and you know there are groups of people who uh, like to single out individuals and make uh, monsters of them. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, one of the things we've talked about a lot is uh, the difference between uh, an emotional appeal for people's attention uh, and the sort of scientist's approach, which is the starched white lab coat and the pocket protector and the nerdy looking glasses and a bunch of uh, numbers mm -hmm. and stuff that puts people to sleep. Okay, and I think singling out an individual and making a monster out of him uh, feeds that sort of emotional uh, uh, storyline that gets people's attention, and it's too bad. Yeah. So Tom says uh, misinformation. Peter Daszak remains a well-respected scientist. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Lori writes, I think human behavior was often overlooked in SARS-CoV-2 pandemic discussions, but not on TWIV. Yeah, we're always talking about how, you know, transmission of any virus depends on human behavior, but it was common to blame it only on the virus, right? <laughs> and we would say, hey, what are people doing? You have to look at that. Uh, Pete says, without embarrassing Rich too much, he certainly had some very lucky students during his working career. He always comes across as a terrific teacher. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, let's see. How effective is a chickenpox vaccine? Does it prevent future cases of shingles? Yes, it's very effective. Uh, though, I think even if you've been vaccinated against um, chickenpox, I think they're still going to want you to take the shingles vaccine when you're all grown up. I don't know. I don't have the data. Dave Bloom comes to mind. He would know. Okay, as to mm. as to how effective the chickenpox vaccine is in uh, preventing shingles. And I uh, I don't have the number for that. But logically, it's, sh well. <clears throat> you know, okay. I don't have the answers here. But 
What does the chicken pox vaccine do? Do you suppose it prevents infection? No, or does I don't it think just it does. Prevent symptoms? Probably doesn't. And yeah. if you get infected, you're going to get with, latent. Yeah. With, uh, you're going to get, you're going to have latent virus, probably yeah. at a lower level, maybe, than you would if you had a natural infection. That's going to make you susceptible to shingles down the road. So my, if I had to guess, I don't have the numbers. I'm sure they're out there. I would guess that the uh, vaccine uh, reduces the incidence of shingles. That's um, right. It does. But I would also, I would also imagine uh, that um, in particular, there's really good shingles vaccines now with no downsides whatsoever uh, because they're protein-based uh, vaccines. That the recommendation is going to be uh, to get the shingles vaccine when you're older because shingles is no joke. Not good yeah, at all. Yeah, according to CDC, some people who are vaccinated against chickenpox get shingles. Years later, it's much much less common after vaccination than after infection. Okay, yeah. good. I remember the, uh, the, the that chickenpox vaccine is an attenuated, infectious attenuated Correct. vaccine. Yep, and the first shingles vaccine was just a double dose of that same that's right. product. That's right. Okay, and yeah. then they came up with an approved thing that's just a protein vaccine. Yeah. Now, I, I understand that Shingrix is being tested as a, actually a, also a chickenpox vaccine because it's so well, good. Well, thank – yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've i been waiting for that because it's so good against shingles yeah. and it's the – you know, the protein – the the it should work against chickenpox. And that would be great uh, because, uh, you know, I, I would prefer uh, – uh, uh, given equal effectiveness, I would prefer a protein vaccine to a live attenuated vaccine, especially one that can cause latency. Yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I prefer the protein vaccine. So it's going to be a more transient thing. Uh, Lori wants to know if the viruses that avoid the nuclear bureaucracy are all in the same family. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about DNA viruses that avoid the nuclear bureaucracy. If you consider all viruses that avoid the nuclear bureaucracy, that includes most of the RNA viruses. And so, no, they are not all in the same family. The DNA viruses, no, they are not all in the same family. But I think, once again, they probably have a common origin. So now I'm thinking about the pox viruses in the context of all the other giant viruses. Mm. Uh, and the phylogeny on those uh, puts them back to uh, a common origin. Now, they're divergent enough now so that there are numerous different uh, families. But I'm trying to think of, I can't think of a um, cytoplasmic DNA virus that doesn't have some relationship with mm -hmm. that family tree or uh Family is a confusing word in that yeah, case yeah. with that phylogeny. <laughs> Here's Neva. I think perhaps the gay community needs good credit for its educational activism in regard to MPOX. That community is perhaps cohesive and sensitized from the HIV experience. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I agree completely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my understanding, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to they anybody. Okay. But uh, my understanding is that um, it is a close-knit community who take care of each other. Uh, John writes, Rich, am I recalling correctly you are in a long-term cohort for people who appear to be super immune to COVID? If so, do you get access to the research? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm not officially uh, in any cohort, but <clears throat> I haven't had COVID. Um, and, uh, no, I, uh, in, in that I am not really a part of any official, co uh, cohort. I don't have any access to any such research. I don't even know if any such research is going on. Um, I would assume there's gotta be people out there who are interested in host factors, of uh, uh, influencing susceptibility to coronavirus infections, but I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any literature or studies. Not that that means much. Uh, the newest variant is supposed to cause bloodshot eyes. What's the mechanism for this? 
Yeah, there's some reports that it hmm. causes conjunctivitis. That's a question for Daniel. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I see that it, there are reports of it, but when when viruses cause conjunctivitis, they're typically reproducing in the eye and causing a, a hemorrhage of the of the blood vessels, so you get the, the blood there. But uh, I'll have to ask Daniel about that. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have uh, 293 people. Uh, we have 230 likes. Hit the like button, folks. We would appreciate cool. it. A lot of people here. Uh, John wants to know, what's a T7 phage and why is it so useful? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so I don't know that uh, T7 has any sort of medical value necessarily. Uh, but its uh, historic value uh, is amazing. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I, you've touched a nerve here because I did my PhD thesis studying phage T7. And uh, what I learned from that really structured much of what I did uh, for the rest of my career, though it wasn't on T7. Um, so I would say that T7 is one of a handful of phages that were studied by uh, what's called the American Phage Group, which was a group of scientists um, headed really by uh, uh, Max Delbrook uh, in collaboration with Salvador Luria and um, Al Hershey. Uh, who really did a, a very directed study of phage as recognizing them as very simple genetic systems that might give some quick answers uh, to what life is at the molecular level. And they were dead right, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because that work over decades on a small number of phages, a small but expanding number of phages, really spawned what we think of as molecular biology and the central dogma, et cetera. What's DNA? How does it work? What's the genetic code? All that come stuff came from studying this handful of bacteriophages and T7 was prominent among those, okay? Now there's another thing about T7 that's really important, <clears throat> uh, which is that uh, its gene expression happens in two phases. It goes into the cells and the host RNA polymerase uh, uh, transcribes, that is, makes RNA from a small fraction of the genome. And uh, uh, one of the gene products is a phage encoded RNA polymerase um, that then transcribes the rest of the genome. Uh, and that phage RNA polymerase is, well, at the time when it was discovered, it was fairly unusual. There are others like this around, but T7 was there first, so it becomes uh, the major player. Uh, among RNA polymerases, it's somewhat unusual in that it is a single protein molecule. A lot of RNA polymerases, like E. coli RNA polymerases, like four subunits, okay? This is only one gene, one polypeptide chain that does the whole trick. Not only that, but it's highly specific for a specific promoter, that is transcription start signal and a specific terminator. What this meant was that it was very easy, relatively easy, to use recombinant DNA technology to make the RNA polymerase and put it in an environment where it could transcribe genes by using the appropriate T7 promoters and terminators in a very specific fashion. And there are all sorts of cloning vectors and expression systems and everything else that are based on this. T7 RNA polymerase and the T7 promoter and terminator. Every time you turn around, you see this. I can't even enumerate the numbers. It's even, uh, yeah. The T7 so, was used for uh, making the, the mRNA vaccines, right? Yes, that's right. T7 RNA polymerase, which meant that somewhere the, the way in the process, good point, Vincent, because uh, that's a, a really good current current example uh, that the those vaccines are made by constructing a DNA plasmid, a, a piece of DNA that has the spike protein gene in it, flanked 
on one end by a T7 RNA polymerase start site, and on the other end by a TNA, T7 RNA polymerase stop site, right. incubated with TNAs, uh, T7 RNA polymerase and a bunch of uh, nucleotides to make the RNA, which is then purified. Unbelievable. Yep. At, at Great big stuff. scale. At scale. <laughs> at scale. We, 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 we marveled uh, at doing that. And back in the day, I have to say, I studied uh, uh, Ed Niles and I in, uh, it would have been 1973. Ed, pure, Ed worked out one of the two first purifications for T7 RNA polymerase and characterized the enzyme. So we and had a twiv I, called yeah. bringing in 50 keys of spike mRNA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ed and I uh, did some work that helped map the T7 RNA polymerase promoter and terminator. Okay. Cool. So this has been, this has been, um, you know, part of my life for 50 years. When do we stop using the word novel to describe a virus? Never. Okay. There. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. There again, you know, the, one of the things I, one of the things I really love about virology is, is the variety. Okay. It, they're every trick in the book they've done variety in structure, variety in lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, variety in sort of transmission and immune evasion and everything else. And it's an, and it's, and it's not just, all this happened, it's happening, okay? So even if we figured out all the viruses that are there now, uh, if we went and looked uh, 10 years from now, we'd have a bunch of novel viruses, okay? So never. Okay, Simon's not driving. He's parked outside his son's evening class. Very good. Good. We were worried I have about wondered you. about this, you know, because you can, you can pair your phone with a big screen in your, uh, in your car. I, yeah. I don't know if you can actually broadcast a YouTube video. Well, good. I'm glad that um, glad that he's not driving. Watson was originally going to call his book Honest Jim. Both Crick and Wilkins did not want him to publish the double helix. I'm not too surprised. Yeah. Molluscum is spread in the same way as Mpox, but much more common, 200,000 cases per year, especially pediatric and high school wrestling. There you go. Yeah. And uh, the high school wrestling, that speaks to the transmission, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if tall people get less COVID by being about the spray zone of regular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, oh. Uh, so we do the study. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to put the Venmo link up. Hang on a moment. Let me see if I can find it. I'm see. I'm at the incubator tonight, so I didn't have my Venmo link. So let me put it. I think it's at Microbe TV. I think you just used it, uh, John. So thank you for your contribution. But let me put uh, the Venmo link up. Yeah, there we go, John. Thank you very much. Uh, the Venmo address is come on telephone at microbe tv so let me put it up here it's it's totally good to use um i'll just add it here there you go at microbe T tv is the venmo address yeah i got all these things on the sh on the screen at home but i'm at the incubator tonight it's missing so you could do the venmo if you'd like to uh, send us a little support we would appreciate it. Uh, with respect to, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. It shows, and it's why we're here. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, uh, this is interesting because, as I said earlier, I've been retired for seven years. And <laughs> I I was concerned when I retired. Well, not really concerned because I was retiring. You know, I figured I was out of here. Okay. And... Uh, and I figured that my utility would drop off real fast since, you know, TWIV is about the only uh, virology or science, uh, it does a little bit more, but it's about the only virology I do on a regular basis anymore. 
Um, and so I figured, and, 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 you know, I don't know nearly as much stuff as Vincent who's, who's active, uh, in it. And I'm certainly not current, but there's a fundamental background. What I've discovered is the fundamental background and the training in critical thinking that never goes away. Uh, and it's always useful. So I can still hold a reasonable conversation and I'm glad of that. Richie, are, are you not, why are you not worried about COVID now, not wearing a mask in crowded places? Is it because of the current antivirals or something else? Please explain so I can better understand. Um, uh, it's because I'm, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm reckless, <laughs> but I don't think so. Um, I think that the uh, the levels of uh, circulation of virus are pretty low. Uh, I think that I am vaccinated as much as I can possibly be. Uh, and I think there is Paxlovid and good medical care out there. So I think the likelihood that I would get seriously ill or die is really small. Uh, and it's small enough so that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get on with my life. Okay. That's the way I look at it. I'm just, yeah, I, yeah, you know, yeah. I, how can I explain it? I'm just not based on what I know. I'm just yeah. not, I'm not concerned anymore. And in so, fact, most of the people I know who, you know, have the same kind of background, uh, feel the same way. I mean, v Vincent, where are you at in this? I, I don't Do wear a mask. I, I, I have, no, I have, three vaccine doses. I got COVID. I feel that I have good immunity. I'm, I'm healthy. I don't have any comorbidities, even though I'm 70. I feel that I, I when I got COVID, I took Paxlovid last year and the next day the symptoms were gone. So that's what I would yeah. do again. And I think wearing a mask uh, is, uh, it's inhibitory in some ways. You can't see people's faces. You can't, I can't hear them speaking as well. So I'd rather not if I don't have to. And there are no more mask mandates around here. So, um, you know, if people want to wear masks for your own risk assessment, that's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, but Rich and I, for these reasons, uh, are not wearing them, no. I took a plane ride not too long ago where I had a cold and I wore a mask out of respect for the people that I was sitting next to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and it's interesting. That's I was fine. thinking about this. Yeah. I was thinking about this recently. You know, the whole mask thing. Uh, you never would have seen people wearing masks before all this happened, but I think it's going to become a, a regular part of the culture where a certain fraction of the population is going to use masks to prevent spread uh, of whatever they've got uh, under the appropriate circumstances. A non-medical pro question. I heard on mass media that the bivalent booster is not very effective. My grandma took the fourth. Will she become more protected by taking the fifth? I mean, it's just Daniel has talked about these results on his clinical update that uh, it doesn't seem that the bivalent is providing any additional protection over what you already have. If you have three doses or maybe four doses, I don't think a fifth is going to particularly help. Now, if your grandma is at, in a risk age, I think uh, the best thing to do would be to get ready with Paxlovid, right, or, or remdesivir if you can't take Paxlovid. That's what Daniel would say. I'm just channeling him because I don't want to give medical advice. <laughs> uh, did I get together with Vivian Morrison at Tulane? I did not. No, we couldn't. We couldn't do it. It's too bad, um, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. We are wrapping down. We got 12 minutes left. Oh, look at this. With a study showing IgG4 antibodies contribute to reinfections. Uh, I just don't buy this. IgG4 are fine at neutralizing, and um, I don't see why people are associating it with reinfections. It doesn't make any sense to me. Going to go over this tomorrow on, uh, you know, this is the story that the mRNA vaccines induce class switching, Rich. <laughs> right. <laughs> to IgG4, which is being perceived as an issue, but as far as I know, they are neutralizing as well as any other antibodies, right? Sounds like I'm going to have to listen to this episode you're doing tomorrow. 
Where are you going to be going? You, you somewhere? I'm going to go sing. Good. There's a Barbershop Harmony Society District Convention in Dallas. I'm going to go sing. And then I'm going to come back and sing. And I sang this afternoon. Wow. A lot of singing. Could a persistent spike be recent asymptomatic infection? I guess suppose it could. Yeah, that's a good explanation for it. I don't know how often they're seeing it, though. Uh, so that, that would be a little suspect. Thank you, Gabriel. So this for is your... the... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, wow. That's Mexican. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's still, it's, it's still uh, This is the other thing. For all I know, I actually have had COVID, right? Yeah, you okay, could have had an asymptomatic infection. I could, have had, I could infection. have had an asymptomatic infection. Yeah. Um, and as uh, Daniel as Daniel helped me discover, and as we've discussed, um, uh, uh, a lot of people who've been vaccinated and uh, have confirmed, uh, PCR-confirmed uh, cases of COVID subsequently, don't test positive for N anti-N antibodies, okay? Mm. So you could even do potentially serology on me, and it might look like I've never been infected when, in fact, I have. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even know that I haven't been infected. Matter of fact, I'll bet you I have. How about that? Maybe. Uh, what's the name of the most common virus that causes symptoms? Or should I ask chat GPT? Well, <laughs> I would say it's rhinoviruses. They infect million, hundreds of millions of people globally. I, I don't know what chat GPT would say, but why don't you check it out? Go for it. I, I don't want to interrupt my... Uh, my questioning here. <laughs> That's really funny. All right. Now, a lot of people are saying they, when you, when you said you didn't have COVID, they're saying, Oh, I don't think I had it either. <laughs> this is great. As a TWIV listener, we know vaccines don't stop infection. They stop serious illness. I love the mantra, right? Don't you love it? Yeah. Actually, the best part of Twelve One Thousand is when you ask the crowd uh, how many oh, yeah. of them were non-scientists, and more than half the people raised their hands. Very cool. That was that was great. Twelve Six Two Five Fred Murphy. Also, if you go to his site, he has a wonderful history of virology that you can download. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah, that's it really is amazing. It's Got really pictures good. of Vincent in it. It does. Yeah, you're in there. I think he uh, he showed us his book when we visited him. Yeah, yeah. I remember that picture. And I you think that's the book he's talking about here. It's a, yeah, it's, a it it's really fun because it's a history of virology, uh, uh, largely in pictures. Yeah, it's really great. Fred's done a. This is a labor of love. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, you should have got to Condit on more often. He's very interesting and knowledgeable. He sure is. Fooled him, didn't I? Uh, Uracil is collaborating on a paper where we are using wastewater to find MPOX. Ah, good. It'd be interesting. That's very that. cool. Should find it, right? Should find it. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, it's a stable critter. I'm just thinking it's. there was never a big load. And uh, from what I understand, it's really back down to baseline at this point. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what you find. Especially if you have historical wastewater samples, that would be interesting, yeah. and depending on where you're located. Uh, Peter says, I used to see that bat bridge, which was talking about out my window. Sometimes when the bats came out in the evening, it smelled like bat poop 18 stories up. Yep. There's a lot of bats under that bridge. Hundreds of thousands, I, I think. Vincent, when did you become vegetarian? I, I'm a vegan. I'm a pescatarian. I eat fish, right? So not strictly a vegetarian, but I don't eat chicken or beef or any meat. When, uh, I think the beginning of last year, when did I, why did I decide? So I'd been toying with it for a long time. Um, <clears throat> it's a combination of not liking how the animals are treated and um, wanting to kind of get healthier. And, and so I feel a lot better having stopped uh, eating meat. I really, I'm really enjoying it. And there's plenty of stuff that you can eat that tastes really good, including fake meat. I like that too. Uh, the Bat Bridge in Austin is going to be the great to view the next solar eclipse. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
uh, it's gonna we're gonna have a complete solar eclipse in Austin. Oh, we're right on the, the edge next, of it. We're right year? on the edge of the pathway. Yeah, that's cool. twenty twenty four. That'll be great. So, in terms of the next pandemic, better leadership, better communication would have and will help in this next, uh, in this and the next pandemic. That's for sure. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, during this conversation, I was thinking that it's unfortunate that uh, Tony Fauci became sort of the sole uh, voice of reason in yeah. all of this. It would be better to have a team of individuals so that you could um, so that you could see people reinforcing each other, okay? or maybe even disagreeing with each other a little bit, doing the science live in front of the public. And there's probably too much of too much concern uh, in the in the health agencies about giving uh, a an airtight, consistent story, and that winds up getting you you in trouble because there is no such thing. It would in in, in a way be better to have you know several individuals, okay, who. Uh, communicated stuff so that um, the attention wasn't so mm. focused on one individual and have a, uh, a maybe a little bit of a variety in the a little bit of nuance yeah okay yeah. Uh, in, in in the discussion and that itself uh, could help people um, are you listening out there Congress mm-hmm <laughs> Here's an idea for you. TWIV is my trusted source, without a doubt. Wished MSM could have a weekly dose mainstream media of your team. Love your values and honesty, whether we like the answer or not. Thank you very much. It's kind of you. Uh, let's see uh, here in these last few minutes. This is a good one. Science is a method and methodology. It isn't a huge dusty tome to which we get access periodically. That's really good. I like that. Yep. Uh, I like that. It's alive. Much. It is alive. Uh, <laughs> we park on driveways and drive on parkways. Humans aren't good at names. <laughs> That's really good. I like that. Okay, yes, our FDA approved the RSV vaccine today for 60 up. How many shots are needed? I don't think we have many variants that are going to be an issue with RSV, right, Rich? No. As far as I know. No. I'm, as far as I understand, there's just one of these guys. But maybe we'll find out different. Uh, but, yeah. you know, I think I, I think there's just one of these guys. Oh, this is a good question. How? What role do you think this new generation of AI is going to play in virology? I think it's going to have a big role. Like, it's going to, it's going to touch everything. Um, Somebody earlier in the chat talked about um, AlphaFold, which is its own kind yeah. of AI, which has also had already had a, an enormous impact. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah, I, uh, more. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, agree. I think we need. I think we need to essentially embrace this with caution, trust but verify. Right. Uh, John says, early on, before I found TWIV, I joined in the vilification of Peter Daszak, which I regret. It was specifically Rich that turned me around on that opinion a while back. It's too easy to vilify strangers. Yeah. There was, uh, he may be referring to a conversation that uh, I, I think was, you know, a TWIV conversation or something like that, where there was a video that the, the naysayers were using that was a clip of you interviewing Peter, yeah, <laughs> at some meeting, uh, well in advance of the pandemic, having this casual conversation about genetically engineering viruses, which we do all the time, and people went, "Oh, look, you know, this is terrible. This is dangerous." No, it wasn't. Okay, and I think we, I think we discussed, I think we discussed yeah. that. Yeah, it, it's okay. We're learning, right? We're all learning. We're, We're learning, learning together. It's all right. Thank you, Ivara, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, Dr. Tanya wears a mask because I'm 60. I have a 105-year-old grandmother to protect. That's a good reason. Besides, many yeah, doctors in reason. New Orleans don't believe in Paxlovid. That's a problem. Oh. Yeah. I'll tell you, a 105-year-old grandma is, I'd be wearing a mask too. 
Yeah. Okay, let's wrap this up. Let's go through and thank anyone else. Dr. Tanya, thank you for your contribution to science communication. Really appreciate it. And we, oh, Vanity says, I, I ate that way when you, when she took my course at Columbia Spring of 21. So I, I've been pescatarian for a while there. Okay. And uh, I think that is it for our donations. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Thank you, Lisa, for your contribution to science communication. And that will do it for uh, office hours for tonight. I want to thank all the moderators. We had everybody here tonight. We had Barb Mack. We had Peak. We had uh, Vanity Nutrition. We had Les. We had Tom. We had Steph. Only person missing was Andrew from New Zealand. Thanks, all of you, for uh, doing this. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming with great questions. Come back next week. Let's see, what are we going to have next week? Uh, we're going to have office hours again. And uh, maybe I could cajole some, someone else to join me. Uh, but 8 p.m. Eastern next Wednesday. Rich, thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate two Absolutely. hours of your time. Anytime, Vincent. Anytime, Vincent. You know I'm always here. <clears throat> All right. You hear that, folks? Rich says anytime he will come to uh, office hours. So we'll take him up on that. All right, that's Office Hours from Microbe TV. Thanks, everybody, and until next week, be safe. Good night.